Hey, well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are across the globe. I am sitting in the presence of, and I feel very privileged and very honoured, of William Mickey Stevenson. And as we go along throughout this interview, or I would say throughout this conversation, you're going to get the essence of who this man is. And I feel very privileged and blessed to have met so many amazing artists and different people in different roles on my journey to LA. So without further ado, I always ask, who is Mickey Sorry, who is William Mickey Stevenson in a nutshell, in a coconut shell, or maybe a peanut shell? <laughs> <laughs> who are you? Who am I? I am, uh, or was, shall we say, mm -hmm. the a &R director of Motown Records. And uh, I ran the whole music division of mm -hmm. Motown for about 10 years, the original Motown. Mm. With Stevie Wonder, Four Tops, Vandellas, Supremes, Marvin Gaye, Funk Brothers, and I can go on. But beyond all that, beyond um, the person who ran all that, who, I'm going to ask you again, who is William <laughs> Mickey Stevenson? Who is the person behind all this, or the essence, I should say? Well... From my point of view, who mm. I am is a person that uh, the man upstairs, God, chose to do a task. Uh, since he made the choice, I was doing it without the knowledge of what I was doing, but I was doing it mm. because of the gift given me. When I found out later in life that it was from God and what the gift was all about, I used it a lot better. But it was going to be used whether I like it or not. <laughs> That's the way it works. Mm -hmm. So in the essence, I am a man of God with a purpose that I must execute constantly until he tells me to stop. And may I call you Mickey? Um, what is that purpose? What is that gift? That gift is to find the best part of the gifts given to others and try and pull that out so they can function, recognize what they got, and succeed in life. So that as they succeed, do what they are given to do, they can also say to others, I have a gift given from God, and here's what I do to help others. And it keeps going and going and going. Mm. And that, that's beautiful because in that, in the spirit of that um, delivery and purpose, can you now share some of the artists that you've worked with? And say, like, say for instance, like the Funk Brothers, Smokey Robinson, um, what was it in them that you saw quite clearly that you recognize they have a particular gift? Well, to not to take the credit for anything, mm -hmm. my point is that once in the beginning, I didn't know that I had the gift for this. I thought I was just, uh, say, finding moments or something in someone that I could say something about or help mm. develop. I didn't know that it was purposely put in my being. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, but I noticed that in the process of dealing with different artists that I got more sensitive and I got better results and that separated some from others, artists I'm speaking of. In that process, uh, it let me know that I had something special that I could pick these people and help them develop what they were doing. Mm. Uh, that's when the spiritual side connected with the human side in me as a human being. Mm -hmm. And now I started looking for that feeling for that inspiration from upstairs. And uh, 
in the end, I, I just let it go that that's what it's all about. So the choices I make were on purpose because the people that I met, like the Four Tops, the Funk Brothers, individually, each person I had a connection with because they were put in my path to connect with, you see? So I feel an amen coming on. <laughs> <laughs> so that put together with what I learned about myself, mm -hmm. that you didn't just walk in my office or I didn't just see you on the street or hear you play. It was a purpose for me to go there to hear you, to connect and work with you. The bottom line is, in my opinion, we all are here for reasons. Mm -hmm. We all have gifts more than one. Now, it's the people that God sent to you or you run into that will help you develop the gifts that you have mm -hmm. that makes it all come together. Yeah. Also, we have the negative side, whereas there are people that you are running into that meet you that will try to pull you down from recognizing that you have something to offer. That's a real battle for human beings. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank God we got to be alert to recognize the ones that mean something and ignore the ones that don't mean something for us. Very difficult. That could be family, people, friends, whatever. Don't, 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 don't leave anybody out of that. Subject. Definitely. Okay, because... Uh, the devil is a very smooth guy. You've been around here a long time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you, first you got to recognize you're on. I hope I'm not taking you on a trip, but I'm just giving you. This is all a part of who well, I am. Well, that, that's absolutely okay. fine. Because what, you, what you're talking about are real um, attributes that we need to develop within ourselves. And also, it is a reality in terms of what's going on out there. And I very much believe that what we see as the negatives oftentimes those experiences are to keep us on our feet. Those experiences are to keep us looking into our mirror of truth to say what's working and what's not working and why is this in my space? And then also it empowers us later down to recognize when that energy is coming again, you're thinking, I am walking that way because you understand and you <laughs> see that energy. You know, what you just said is what I call wisdom. Mm. You're acquiring wisdom That's and right. knowledge and you get that from the path that you're walking on. Mm -hmm. You begin to separate. If you ignore that as wisdom and knowledge and take it as, oh my God, that's not right. Uh -uh, not for that. Mm -hmm. It's for you to say, ah, when I see that again, I will recognize how to handle that. That's see, right. Most people take it the wrong way. It's not that you something bad happened to you. Something was put in your path so you can acquire mm -hmm. wisdom and knowledge. If you ignore that, you're not getting the lesson. Mm -hmm. You go sit in the school, you sit there all day and listen to teachers teach you. And you're there for wisdom and knowledge. And you and you, you go out to toss it away. Well, the life's wisdom and knowledge comes from people and things around you as you walk through life. Yes. That's the school, you see. So you got to take that into consideration. And you say, okay, aha, uh -huh, I got that. Mm -hmm. I got that. Some of it hurts. Some of it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. But you must put it in the brain, run it through your computer here, and say, okay, I won't forget that. Mm -hmm. And you will not forget it. And it pays off. And when you talk to someone else about their talents or their gifts or whatever, you have some nice things, logical things to say to them because you have been through some of that. Mm, definitely. So definitely. If they don't want to listen, pull another ball game. Mm -hmm. Don't waste your time on people who don't want to listen. Keep going, because God got others for you to deal with. A whole lot of us out there. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. And this, um, Mickey, then leads on to the next question of Motown. You know, your stint at Motown, how did you remain grounded? Because you've come through, you've had the most eclectic experiences. You've changed so many lives. You've worked with so many people, so many artists. You've directed, you know, you produced, you directed, you guided, you mentored. So how did you remain grounded throughout that whole process? I became a personal And connecting with each person that I work with, 
I represented someone to them, a father, a friend, a cousin, a brother. And they looked at me from that point of view, as well as the a &R man running the operation. But the second part, the part where I'm your brother or your cousin or your friend or your father, whatever, they could communicate with me and give me, come from the heart. Mm -hmm. Strictly as a business, uh, it was, that's one approach. But when they come from the heart, mm -hmm. they can say, I got a problem. And I'll say, what's the problem? Okay, Mickey, here's what happened. And they'll run it down and then we come to and we kind of resolve and solve that problem. Well, I was, I meant something to each person. And, and I got to tell you, they meant something to me. Now, personally, my uh, functioning like that, if I got 12 people and there's none, no stop of a call, a call could come at one o'clock in the morning. And, and, and since they had this confidence in me, mm -hmm. I had to answer that call. I could not ignore that they called or whatever. Now, what that did was build the confidence with the artists to a family feeling and they prospered. My personal life didn't quite work out the same way because mm -hmm. my energy and time went out to others. Mm -hmm. That could be, that's a debt you pay. I mean, that's a price that goes along with this. Mm -hmm. I had to make a decision. Do I stay with this all the way or just do it every now and then? Mm -hmm. Well, my decision didn't matter. God had already chosen what my decision would be. And he would say to me in his way by showing me, don't worry about that. Do what I got you here to do. All things will be fine. Do me first and everything else will follow. If you take me out the way to do what you want to do, you're going to have a problem. I will just have to leave you alone and you will have the problem. The system will give you the problem. With me, the system can't touch you but so much. You see, and that boy, that's a tough lesson to learn. It's a powerful one as well, though, isn't it? Tough but powerful. And as you're talking, you know, there's a strength in you. There's a, there's um, there are all these wonderful attributes, grounded attributes. But I also believe a lot of those attributes and and your mindset was formed in your formative years because you went through quite a lot in your formative years. Mm -hmm. You share about your mother bringing up. Was it four boys, if I remember correctly, on her own? And she passed away at 28 from cancer. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then you talked about your various visits to the juvenile center <laughs> and, you know, all the other things that comes with maybe just working through your grief, trying to find out who you are, trying to find your path. And what was really clear in the book where you talked about you didn't want to um, be on welfare. You didn't want to take any handouts. Hey. So you had to hustle. Hey. It, it was the hustle. So all those things really built a platform of self-preservation, but self-determination. Um, so can you just share a little bit more about your formative years and, you know, the, the path that they put you on, in effect? Well, what, you know, when I was a teenager... Of course, blacks stayed in a certain area of Detroit. Mm -hmm. And if you step out that area, you had a problem. You might as well be in the South. And what bothered me as a young kid was I could be standing on the street and I see the planes go by and stuff like that. I say, well, is this it for me? We, this is this little spot. It's where we, we got to grow and die right here. I don't, I don't that, that don't work for me. Where, how, first of all, how did that plane get in the air and move like that? How did that happen? And where is it going? And why do I have to stand here? I'd rather be up there than to be down here standing on this ground uh, eating a hamburger for 10 cents. Why can't I have one of those steaks over there? So I had a lot of questions. And... Uh, I figured that uh, not knowing this was already being put in my head, I just thought, I'm thinking of all this for me, mm -hmm. that this is not right. It's got to be better than that. 
So my desire to be better took me in a lot of places, not good places. You know, so I was into hustling like everybody else and surviving, and but I didn't want to stand still in none of that. I thought I'd use this to keep going so I can get on one of those planes and see what's crawling, where is it going so I can see where it's going. At any rate, that was a, a constant grind for me. And I never stopped. I mean, I remember, I remember working in a, in a, uh, for a Sam Bazzesi and Sons grocery truck where we'd pick up fruit and groceries and stuff and take them way up into the valleys mm -hmm. in, in Michigan. And the old guy would get out of the driver's seat and tell me to drive the truck. And I said, I don't know how to drive it. He said, well, you're gonna learn. <laughs> but he was such a powerful old guy. And with him, I learned that you can do anything if you put your mind to it. If you say, no, I can't, you have already stopped yourself. You gotta take a shot. Now you gotta have somebody to tell to, or around you to say, don't say no. Yes. Don't accept no for an answer. Yes. Try it. The worst thing can happen is you learn something. I took that with me throughout life, you see. So some, as a matter of fact, when I got with Barry, he said to me, well, you know, this is a thing I want you to do to a and R for with the music business. He said, you, you, can you handle it? I said, I can do anything. <laughs> that was my running. If it's music, a business, I'm your man. I can do it. And that, that leads nicely into um, your book. If you just show us, hold up the book so that we can see the book. You tell your story in the book, Motown's first A&R Man presents the A&R Man, really. <laughs> what is, um, how would you break down A&R? Uh, artists and repertoire is what it's saying, but for the job itself is uh, you find the artist, mm -hmm. That's where we were talking in the beginning. I got to make sure that you got the gifts mm -hmm. that and that you want to uh, bring that gift forward. Mm -hmm. I got so say you have a gift to sing. All right. So when I hear you mm -hmm. and I hear that voice, I said, okay, you have a gift. Now I got to also study you to see if you will be able to work together yes. because egos. And all kind of things come with the gift, and you may not be able to control that. Now, you can have the greatest voice in the world, mm -hmm. but we can't work together. It ain't, it's not going to happen. you got to learn to control yourself, mm -hmm. or you're going to reach a wall with your gift and not go any further. Now, that can come from the people around you and disappointments and things like that, and relationships can cut that down. But my job is to see if I can get you to get over that and do things for yourself. Brilliant. You see? So that's my job. First, I see the gift. Now to get you to do things for yourself. If you can do things for yourself, then you can do things that I'm going to suggest that make do yourself better. You got it? All right. So that's part of it. Mm -hmm. Then the other part was that uh, uh, I have to find the musicians and the others to make this music or your gifts take on a greater sound. Mm. So each person was separately picked to make that happen. And that gave us, shall we say, uh, a family, an organization, a family. The producers, the writers, the musicians, and myself, we had to have a respect and love for one another. It's okay to argue every now and then, but what and, if, and before that argument is over, we got to resolve that and let's get down to what we're here for. Brilliant. And when you put that in the picture, the arguments don't last too long mm -hmm. because the goal is the key. Mm -hmm. So I hope I didn't get off the subject. No, right? no, no, because this is really important because you know, interviewing a lot of artists, I always say old school artists or legend, well. Gerard Olsen said, not legendary, classic artists, classic legends of those who have passed on. Um, but, you know, having those, those, those basis of value systems as a platform to leap off from, to work from, if you don't have that base, then, 
you know, when you start to move on up the chain, it creates so many other stuff because you're bringing that stuff with you. <laughs> and, right. and also, it's about having the tools to manage so that even if something erupts halfway up, you've got the tools and the understanding of this is what we need to do in order to leverage this out so it doesn't walk with us into the next part of the journey. So that was absolutely fine what you shared. And I know that you've worked with so many people, Mickey. Can you share maybe one or two? Because I know you play golf with Smokey regularly. Uh, we played yesterday. <laughs> He took my money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's let's start with Smokey. Smokey, what was it like working with Smokey? What did you initially see in him? Well, Smokey was there when Smokey and Barry were together before I got there. Okay, apologies. So uh, that's when we were just getting started with the mm. Motown uh, operation, and but Smokey. In school, he had his group mm -hmm. singing around the colleges and stuff, and I had my group. So we knew each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would say, as a matter of fact, when, Barry, when we when we met together at Barry's apartment, uh, Barry said, no, no, Smokey said, man, Mickey, what you doing here? And Barry said, he's going to be the a &R man for our company. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, man, that's great. And he said, Barry said, well, what, what's happening? He said, man, this guy was, and we would battle off groups around the city, you know, working for different parties and stuff like that. Uh -huh. He said, man, this guy would wear us out all the time because my group was always better. Or my, not better, see, we sung jazz mm. and he sung R&B. See, so they kind of looked up to my group for that purpose. And uh, he said, oh my God, man, uh, Mickey, you're going to, you're going to, I, I got a session coming up. In two days, I need some musicians for that. And I said, don't worry about it. I got this. Uh -huh. So he was, we, we hit it off together right away because we knew each other from mm. high school and all that. And, and he's never changed. I used to tell him, I said, God has really touched you because you can come up with some of the dumbest things to do. And don't have no problem. Anybody else do that, they'd be in trouble. And I said, so he's keeping you out of a lot of mess because he got plans for you. And Smokey, to this very day, mm -hmm. always give God the glory. And I told him, I said, as we got older together, I said, listen, my brother, as long as you keep doing that, you're going to be around. Because mm -hmm. you stand in front of 5,000 people and say, God made this happen. Others can stand in front of 10,000 people and say, I made this happen. Mm -hmm. And they're no longer here. I say, so every time we look at it, you and I are still standing here because we say where it came from. And that's the whole purpose of him giving you the platform. Not for you to say who you are, mm -hmm. but to say who he is. You see, and if two people get the picture out there, we've done a job. If a hundred get the picture, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Our lives get extended. So, and I said, you have got you got no problems. We we and we pray every time we play. Brilliant. You know Brilliant. what I mean? I We're that. blessed. You see, yeah. blessing's not always money and this and that. Blessing is just breathing and living. Mm -hmm. And you're definitely living, aren't you? You know what I'm saying? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and which which other artists, or I mean, there's so many, so I'm going to try and um, sort of segue this down. But if you can, what other two artists that you've worked with or come across who have really stood out for you? Not, and this is not saying that there aren't others that have stood out for you, okay, but you right. know, what, what's coming to you now? Because I'm just le le well, giving of course, two choices. Stevie oh, yes. Uh, when uh, I, I, Stevie came to me through my assistant, who was Clarence Paul. He and I used to do uh, Sam and Dave kind of songs around the country. Mm -hmm. And when I took the job with Motown, I, I brought him in because uh, I think I felt I owed him because he's taught me some things. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, come on. Anyway, he brought Stevie Wonder to me. And uh, and I had my doubts because when I found out that in the book, I explained more about, mm -hmm. you know, he was, he, 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 what am I going to do with a kid? You know, I got problems. I don't need no trouble in, in the studio with Motown with him and all that. Bottom line was, when I made the decision to listen to Stevie and deal with him 
at 11 years old or something, I said, wow, God has definitely given this guy a gift. I mean, this is incredible. Now, how do we, how do I deal with an 11 year old kid? How do I make that, you know, make that gift come forward? That's kind of tough. But the Lord said, uh uh, it ain't tough. It's going to be your easiest job. <laughs> At any rate, working with Stevie and watching him develop was incredible. And I used to have other people come in to me to audition, uh, and they would say, well, you know, uh, I need to have a piano, and I need uh, some musicians, and uh, I'd get my voice together. I'd say, hang on one second. I'd say, Stevie, come here. Sing a song right quick. Mm -hmm. Stevie starts singing, out of no, bam, sing. Then I tell the person who auditioned, see, he didn't got no piano. He don't have no music. If he had music, he couldn't read it, no way. <laughs> and he can stand there and sing, and you tell me you need all this? You better think about what you're saying to people. And I used to, and, 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 but that's a, that's a shocker, you know. They come in with their egos. Mm -hmm. The gift now, but they got egos and this, and they got to have this, got to have that. And then here's the guy. 11 or 12 years old, no piano, no music, no nothing, just stand right there and sing right off the bat. Now that puts you in a very uncomfortable position. So I said, why don't you go back home, get yourself together, and when you can come back and do what this blind kid can do, then we'll talk. But I watched him grow. He would study every producer in and out of their offices, watching them write music, and he would absorb things like a sponge. And it was just absolute magic. Same thing with Marvin Gaye. When Marvin Gaye came, Barry brought Marvin Gaye to my office. Yeah, and he said to me, I want to hit on this guy. And I said, Barry, Marvin sings jazz. We don't do jazz. Let's, you know, there ain't no percentage in that for us. He said, I didn't say jazz. He said, I want to hit. Now you say you can do anything, right? I said, yeah, he said, okay, give, give me a hit on Marvin Gaye. I said, how much? He said, what's the deal? Now we always bet on everything here. Uh -huh. He said, okay, $500. I said, no, 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 this is a tough one, $1,000. He said, okay, $1,000 bet. So I had to sit Marvin down and get him to understand that he was originally a gospel singer. Let's get back to the soul mm -hmm. of the music. Now I know you don't want to. You want to be Nat King Cole or uh, Andy Williams, but uh, can you hold that for a minute and let's go <laughs> the other way? <laughs> it took a little while to do that with him. We started writing together, but as we were writing songs together, I could see that he had a whole nother thing going on. A whole nother gift other than his voice he had something to say then he had it to say and I said wow this guy has got a lot going on I eventually got him to record a song and I did it by in our writing songs for other people mm -hmm. in our day we had tape recorders and writers would sing their line and you sang your line and we record everything so you don't lose anything. Mm. So what I did was, in essence, I clipped all my verses out, taped all of his together. And then he came in one evening, I said, I want you to listen to something. And I played the song where all his verses ran concurrently, soulfully, spiritually. And I said, hey, man, instead of us giving this song to the contours of somebody, why don't you do this song? Mm -hmm. He said, man, but I was going to do some jazz. I said, I'll do some jazz. But in the meantime, this could be a hit song with you and take me off the hook with Barry. So in essence, he agreed to do it for me for the sake that I would do the jazz album. So when I, when I we cut the tune, was, I think it was Stubborn Kind of Fellow. And I walked up to Barry with the demo in my hand. I said, okay, give me my money, man. <laughs> he said, give, give, my, said, give me my thousand dollars. He said, wait a minute. I said, hold it. Here's the, here's the, here's the, the tape. Go to your office, play it, and then uh, tell me what you think. He took the CD with her, went upstairs, played it, came back down, reached in his pocket, took a lot of my money, gave it to me, said, man, how'd you do that? I said, you don't want to know. <laughs> but Marvin, from that point on, 
of course, I, I kind of talked him into doing the album, but I promised him, you know, his R&B album because the song took off. Then, uh, of course, I, I made a, a deal with him that I would do a, a jazz album, and which I did a jazz album with him. Mm -hmm. But uh, in working with him, the thing that I saw that he had to say slowly started coming out in his writing, mm -hmm. in his attitude, uh, politically. We'd have meetings, and not meetings, but talking in the office, waiting to go in the studio, and he'd get right into a political conversation and I mean, the guy had something to say, and it came out in his music, mm -hmm. uh, which was great. So he had the voice. So, of course, the gift was given him for a wonderful purpose. Surrounding sources was a battle for him, but, uh, right. but he was wonderful. He was wonderful, and, and to watch the way the Lord used him was incredible. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the Funk Brothers, individually, they were incredible, each one of them. They all had something to say, and they and they all. It's amazing. I, as I met them individually, uh -huh. and I brought them in, there were musicians in Detroit that were very good, mm -hmm. but they were set in their way. Their egos and their prides wasn't going to work for me. Like I say, when you're on a mission. Mm -hmm. You are uh, guided to the right people, or the right people will come in your space. You just got to recognize. Now, a lot of other people are going to come in your space, too. You got to yes. know when to walk away. But there were better musicians. Now, but I'm not just unfair, not better. Let's just say they were very good, but it wasn't going to work for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, the ones that I had the, the fortunate to run into and talk with that had it, they all had individual problems. Mm -hmm. And they felt that if they got with me, that some of these problems would be solved. Is that because of your reputation, um, but also because of who you were? Was well, it a combination of both? I, I wasn't really anybody then to, okay. to talk about. But the, they knew me from, if I make a deal with you, I stick to the deal, even if I lose on the deal. If we make a deal. It's your reputation. Yeah, we got yeah. a deal. Now, but I, but I, but I demand that you rep, you stick with your end of the deal too. Not ask. I demand it. Mm. Now, if you don't want to take the demand, let's not do business. Real simple. Let's just stay friends. Mm. You know what I mean? Because if I can commit, you got to commit. Yes. That was the deal. Yeah. And sometimes I had to pay off because it didn't work out, but I, I still made a made a commitment. And uh, so that I was known for that. You yeah, know. your reputation preceded oh, yeah. you. Oh, yeah. yeah. And Mickey, this year it's 60 years of Motown, celebrating Motown. Right. Yeah, so the, this year we're celebrating 60 years of Motown. What's on the cards? What's coming up for us all to delight in and to revel in and to reminisce in and, and all those wonderful things as we celebrate with some incredibly um, incredible people? Well, well they got a, we have this show coming on. I think it's next month. I'm not sure. Mm. But of 60 years of old. Okay. And the wonderful thing was to see those of us that were there it is amazing. And to look back, Motown, okay. and this the timing is so so phenomenal. You know, I I, I love telling people that uh, I say that Detroit was a place where we made cars, yes. not music, and the music was made in Chicago, Detroit. I mean, Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, Nashville, all that stuff, and and the people picked and chosen by God to start this organization, this Motown, were not in that caliber. We were in a whole nother world. But uh, like all things, he chose this spot and these people, including me, to make this happen. Mm -hmm. So that it you could not deny that it was a powerful force that created this. Mm -hmm. And we went past all the major companies in the world in music. 
with all the greatest writers and musicians and, and uh, entrepreneurs, and we passed all that up, went right past all of them. Not knowing that we were going to do this, we just wanted to make, at it to make a living. Mm -hmm. But God had another purpose for it, and it went past all these companies. And I'm saying that to say, whatever was chosen, or whatever he ch chooses, lasts forever. So I'm not surprised of the 60. Mm. I'm looking for 30 more. Wish I'd be <laughs> around to see it because it's forever. Yes. yes. You know, and uh, to see this for the, the 60th anniversary, as I look around at the, those of us that are there, or will be in the, uh, the TV show and all that, it is amazing. The energy was still the same. The conversation was still the same. We are still a family. Brilliant. That's incredible. That's key. That's Talk key. like we never left each other. As if we were at work every day. Because it wasn't work. That's another point. When you into something that you love to do, mm -hmm. it's only a job but someone looking at you. To you is a joy. You need more time. <laughs> Big difference. And Mickey... So I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to wind down, but I keep getting so many other questions coming through. But for you, you know, on the days, that's if you had those days, on the days when sometimes life did feel difficult, on the days when you thought, do I have to get out of my bed? On the days when you might have looked around you and thought, you know, this, this is a lot to deal with. What inspired you to just get up and say, this needs to be done. I need to take responsibility to do whatever needs to be done. I, I, I really don't have an answer for that. I've been asked that question a few times. Mm. And the only thing I know about me is once I start something, I must finish it. Mm -hmm. No matter what it takes, I got to finish. If I don't want to finish, don't start. You see? Mm -hmm. But I got to finish. And that's the inner driving force and I, I I accept it as part of my I guess nature mm -hmm. uh, uh, the way that I am I don't believe in times and and things like that I think there is no time numbers yeah, I don't yeah. believe in that I believe that you are here for a purpose you do your thing and you and, and even if it doesn't come out like you want to mm -hmm. finish it what do you get out of it out of it if it don't come out right you learn something you learn what not to do and what to do. Mm. Now, do you want to try it again? You might even learn that even worth not even worth being bothered with. Let's go do this. Yes. You see, but you can't get that knowledge unless you finish whatever it is that you start to do. Mm. Let it cut itself off because it is not working. Don't you not do it? Mm. How how do you know what you will accomplish or not accomplish if you don't stay with it? It's okay not to win, because out of that comes knowledge and wisdom. So you learn something. But to quit without a reason other than, you know, I'm tired or I don't feel, that's a bad way to go out. That means your life can go on like that, and you never really accomplish anything. Who can you blame it on? Blame it on you, because you stopped. Uh, am I making sense here? You are, because the next question and sort of penultimate question is, you know, where to from now for Mickey? You know, um, you said you hope to be around for another 30 years to celebrate Motown in 30 years' time. <laughs> Take all I get. In, in the book, in the, in the Bible, I don't, know, I don't know who it was. One of the kings said to the God, to God who's supposed to time for him to leave here and go to, the, go to heaven. He said, can, can I get 10 more years? <laughs> And the Lord said, you've been pretty good. Okay, you got two more years. <laughs> so I'm asking every time I get a certain number, I say, okay, Father, can I get another? Uh, no, okay, okay, you got it. Mm. And how are you going to feel those years? I mean, what, what's on the cards for Mickey um, sort of moving forward? Well, I, uh, I'm doing the uh, Azusa Revival musical where the Holy Spirit came down on Azusa Street in California, mm. which was an unbelievable story, but it is most absolutely a fact and I turned it into a musical, and I think it's going to be the biggest thing I've ever done. Uh, 
which is fantastic. And I'm doing uh, Les Gems, which is a show about women mm -hmm. and their struggle. And uh, one of the main songs in this show is Put a Woman in the White House Today, which I wrote years ago, and it's happening now. Yes. So I got a few things happening that uh, they got to be completed, see? So I got to be around to complete them. <laughs> so I'm having a great time. Better time than I had um, 60 years ago. How's that? That's good. You're, you're, um, they, t they talk about how grapes ripen and I feel it's you know this is your season and you're being 